This is the biblical manuscript designated Papyrus 46. It was created around the year 200. In its current state, it's made up of 86 leaves of papyri and contains most of the Pauline epistles. What we're looking at here is the oldest known copy of the Epistle to the Ephesians. And we're going to read and walk through a translation of verse 10 of chapter 2. But before we do that, let's begin with some context. It is generally accepted that the Apostle Paul was the author of this piece of literature, and his intended audience was the Christians living in and around the city of Ephesus. Both are attested to in the text itself, although in Papyrus 46 here, the phrase in Ephesus in verse 1 of chapter 1 is actually missing. Whereas it is present in most other manuscripts, which number in the thousands, although this one does have the heading to the Ephesians. So at least by the end of the second century when this copy was made, it was accepted that this was a letter of Paul meant for the Christians in Ephesus. The ancient city of Ephesus at the time was the third largest in the Roman Empire and a major center of commerce and culture. It was a hub of early Christianity, with Paul himself spending a few years there. Throughout this letter, there are some references to Paul's imprisonment, which, if taken at face value, gives us a date from anywhere between the years 55 to 65. So a likely scenario for the writing of this epistle would be that while Paul was imprisoned at either Rome, Caesarea, or even Ephesus itself, he wrote the letters of Ephesians and Colossians and gave them to a man named Tuchikos, who then carried them to the cities of Ephesus and Colossae. Both of these epistles are very similar in content, and both mention Tuchikos as the carrier. And beyond the mention of the city of Ephesus, the recipients of this letter are assumed to be Christians that were once Gentiles, that is, non-Jews that have converted to Christianity. Copies of Paul's letters would eventually be collected together and copied further and passed on to Christians all over the Greco-Roman world. One of these copies being Papyrus 46, which is the one we're going to be reading from. The content of this letter is very general. It doesn't even address any specific person or issue among the Christians at Ephesus. This has led many scholars to doubt the Pauline authorship, but for our purposes here, we'll just take the Pauline authorship at face value. The letter opens with an introduction and prayer, and concludes with some final remarks and the naming of Tukaikos as the carrier. The body of the letter is didactic in nature, meaning that it is straightforward teaching. There are two main parts. First is a description of what a Christian is, and the second is a description of Christian behavior. So the logical flow of this letter is a Christian is this, therefore a Christian will act like this. And the verse we're going to be looking at is in this first part. It is the last verse of a section that describes what salvation is as well as what it is not. Since the message of this epistle is didactic and meant for a general audience of Christians, if you are a Christian then you have that shared context with the original recipients. So once we get past the obstacle of the ancient language, its meaning and application for you will be rather straightforward. Now, before we move on to looking at the grammar, I'm just going to read through this section in the New Living Translation, just for context. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. 
so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Returning to our manuscript, here is verse 10 of chapter 2, although the first few words are on the bottom of the previous page. But as you can see, this corner of this page is damaged. Going off the available space here and other ancient manuscripts, we can reconstruct these few words as being we too God as men, meaning we are his. And while we're looking at this damaged corner here, I just want to point out that when we zoom in, we can see the reed fibers that make up this piece of papyrus. It is indeed quite amazing that this has survived till today. Given that it is made out of plant matter, and it is nearly 1,825 years old. All right, continuing on, on the top of the next page, we read, Oyema, kisthentes en Christo Jesu, epi ergois agathois, ois proetoimesen hothios, hinach en atois peripetesumen. All right, let's give ourselves a little space to work here. Oyema is a noun, and it means something like creation, workmanship, or craftsmanship. The idea is that it is a thing produced through an act of creation. Kataisthentes is a verb. It is an aorist passive participle, plural, from the root kataizo, meaning to create, so having been created. N is the preposition, which has a very wide range of meanings, and there is a usage of en Christo, or in Christ, that is found almost exclusive to Paul's writings, and it has a very particular theological meaning. We see this usage in verses 6 and 7. But here, since it follows the verb created, and it is followed by a personal noun in a dative case, it is best to take this preposition as instrumental. So the following noun is the instrument or means of the action. So by means of. And here we see the abbreviated form of Christo Iesu, Christ Jesus. Epi is a preposition that has a lot of different uses. Here it is something like in order to or for the purpose of. Ergois is a plural noun, meaning works or deeds. Agathois is an adjective, meaning good, and it is in grammatical agreement with the previous word, so it's modifying ergois, so good ones. Ois is the relative pronoun, who or which, and since its antecedent is the plural noun ergois, we can go with those which. Proetoimesen is a verb from the root, proetoimazo, meaning to establish, to make ready, or to prepare beforehand. It is an aorist, active, indicative, third-person singular. So, he prepared. Ho theos is God. Being a proper noun, it takes the definite article, and it is in a nominative case. So, this is the subject of this clause. So, God is the one doing the preparing beforehand. Hina is the conjunction, meaning so that, or in order that. N is the preposition. In this instance, it is indicating a manner of doing the action. So, in the manner of. Altois is the third person plural personal pronoun. Its antecedent being the works. So, them. Peripataisomen is a verb from the root, peripateo, meaning to walk, although most of the time it is used as a metaphor for a way or manner of living. It is an aorist active subjunctive first-person plural, so that we may walk. So, a very awkward yet literal translation would be, we are his craftsmanship, ones that have been created by means of Christ Jesus for the purpose of works, good ones, those which he prepared, God, so that in the manner of them we may walk. Smoothing this out into a little better English, we get a more dynamic equivalent translation of we are his craftsmanship, having been created by Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared so we can make them a way of life.
Now let me point out just a few interesting things about Paul's choice of vocabulary here. These three words, these two verbs in this noun, can all be translated creation or created. In fact, this is the exact terminology that is used throughout the Septuagint for the Hebrew terms regarding God's act of creation. Even though the Christians that this epistle was written to were non-Jews, they would have been familiar with the Septuagint, especially having been taught by Jewish Christian leaders like Paul, Apollos, and Timothy. So it is somewhat reasonable to assume that the audience would have picked up on the allusions to the creation language of the Hebrew Bible. It is also important to point out here that this word here is also used in verse 2 of chapter 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked. So this whole section is bracketed with this contrast of the way you once walked in sin, and now that you've been recreated in Christ, you walk in good works. Outlining the logic of this verse, we have three clauses. The first one is a general clause, whereas the following two are parenthetical. So, we are his creation. The next clause explains how and what for, created by Christ for good works. And the final clause explains what good works, that is, those prepared by God for us, so we may walk in them. Reading verse 10 in its context, we see Paul describing being a Christian as a regeneration of one's humanity, that is, a restoring of the original purpose of humanity. And it is contrasted with the state of death, with behaviors flowing from following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. Whereas one with their humanity restored by Christ now can live a life of good works. We also see Paul describing this transformation as moving from one kingdom to another. That is, one is removed or liberated from the dominion of their old master. In these descriptions of this transformation, or restoration, rather, the emphasis is on that it is absolutely not a change in behavior that is the catalyst for the transformation. This movement from death to life, from one kingdom to another, it is a gift. It is simply given. So the case Paul is making here with this verse is that these good works flow from what you are as a Christian. And in the second half of this epistle, he goes on to describe what these good works look like being lived out. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. And that word walk there comes from the same root that is in verse 10, peripateo. So for the Christian, since your purpose in life flows from what you are, that is, it is ontological, your circumstances and how you feel have no bearing on the meaning of your life. All you have to do in order to fulfill your purpose is to do what God has put in front of you to do. In a world full of suffering and chaos, there's no shortage of ways, no matter how small, that you can fulfill your reason for being, by being God's agent, by simply doing good, and therefore reducing the amount of suffering and chaos that we find in the world. Reading this verse this way, as a restoration to the original human purpose, suggests that walking in sin, as it is described in verses 1 and 2 of this chapter, is to behave in a way that is contrary to God's design and purpose for humans. It's like taking a tool, like a hammer, which has very specific design features so it can fulfill its intended purpose. And if you use it as designed, it is effective and reduces the effort required to drive a nail. But if you use it contrary to that purpose, like if you try to use it as a air conditioner, for example, well, like sin, it will all end in tears. So, according to Paul, for the Christian, your raison d'etre, your reason for being, has been restored to the original purpose for humanity. So your life's purpose and your identity in Christ is ontological, that is, it is part of what you are, and what you are is human, in the truest original sense. 